Soren Markov, the Lord of Innistrad. He's magic's only vampire planeswalker. Uh, uh, hey. Yeah, yeah, only vampire planeswalker. He's a primarily black mana walker, but more often than not, his cards are black-white. He was the premier Orzhov planeswalker before Kaya showed up. And he's a cool vampire! Thousands of years old, drinks blood, hates the sun, maybe, that one really comes up. But he's super strong and fast, and he doesn't turn into a bat, but he can manipulate blood directly with his mind. The self-described lord and protector of his homeworld, and one of the multiverse's oldest living planeswalkers. All these details combine to create a pretty powerful and imposing image of a character. Have you seen how he's described in flavor text? Many who cross Soren's path come down with a sudden and fatal case of being in the way of a millennia old vampire. This is the front facing persona of Soren. Detached, capable, commanding, deadly. Like, like a vampire. He even looks loads like Castlevania's Alucard on the alt art for his new card. Although I'm way more into Martina Fakova's Geralt esque one personally. Dang. Dang. But either way, sexy, dark, powerful vampire man. His cards are good and everything, usually. They drain life, they make vampires. He must be fantastic at being a vampire. Like a Dracula or something. A success, you might say, if you were trying to position him as the opposite of something for the intro to a video. The picture of vampiric success. And if you've not read any of the stories Soren's featured in, you have no reason not to think of him like this. It's his public face. But what if I told you that that isn't the character as written? That the Soren I know is basically incapable of success and defined by his failures. The vampiric badass, nothing but a thin veil draped over a complete fuck up. The Sorin I know has fallen short of nearly everything he's attempted in any set he's been in, as plans and worlds crumble at his inadequacy. This isn't to say Sorin's a bad character, nah, he's great. Through his continual bumbling, he becomes a perfect representative of the clash of values in the pairing of his two opposed colors. The selfish nature of black versus the selflessness of white. And I have an intense urge, a need, if you will, to make you know the real Sorin, like I do. To slip past the imposing veneer and glimpse the human problems of the vampire man underneath. So let's get to know Sorin then, by looking at what he actually did in the story of every set he's been in. We're going to go through Sorin's role in every set that's featured him what his goal was during each, and what he actually accomplished. And along the way, we're going to paint an honest picture of Magic's plane hopping vampire, and come to know him as he really is. Flaws and all. Oh, it's all flaws. But I want this picture to take shape in the order that it was originally formed, to know him as he was written. So we're going to run down Soren's story, real world chronologically from our perspective, as it was released not in-universe chronologically. Who he was each time Wizards presented him to us. We can keep score and everything! I've got a bullshit set of rules in mind based entirely on how I feel. I'm gonna consider what Soren's short and long-term goals were during each set, how successful his efforts were at achieving them, and how his short and long-term goals conflict with each other. Stuff that happens in backstory or flashbacks doesn't count, only what he did during each set. Look, here's Soren's scoreboard. I can give him a win, or a loss, or a nothing for every set where he featured and did something in the story. And we can tally it up at the end, and the premise of the video definitely hasn't spoiled the outcome already. I'm mostly going to score him on individual sets, but for a couple of the blocks he's in, I'll score him once for the entire thing, as their stories don't describe his actions for each contained set, just on the whole. It'll make sense. So yeah, Sorin. He's who I decided to make a video about. This was going to be Guildless 3, honest. Which is still happening. I wrote a chunk of that, but then I just needed a mental break from Ravnica, and I thought, I know, I'll make a short topical video for the new Innistrad sets. I love Innistrad, and I've been complaining about Sorin to people who don't care for years. But the short, quick version was neither, and kind of impenetrable, and just bad. So I rewrote it, and the script ended up at 13,000 words, and I had a, got a new job, and I don't have any time anymore, and uh, Elden Ring didn't help. <laughs> Suddenly, Innistrad was a distant memory again, fading under intense neon glare. And then a gorgeous looking, but kind of shallow version of Ravnica. And then a set that's about D&D, when it should be about magic. Oh darn it. And then bloody Dominaria again. So here we are, with a video that is neither short nor topical, but better than the short topical version would have been. You're welcome. I'm a silver mere who dreamed he was a real boy. In the dream, my name was James, and I'd spent far too long 
moaning about the character Sorin Markov as if he was an actual person. It went something like this. Zendikar Block. Sorin first appeared in the original Zendikar set 13 years ago. What have I done with my time? Zendikar is Magic's adventure world. It's the D&D set before there was a D&D set. It's all about parties of uniquely skilled travellers exploring forgotten tombs and shattered remnants of ancient civilizations. Zendikar is full of all kinds of danger. Its wildlife is as deadly as it is exotic, and a constant land animating and altering violently magical effect called the Royal means that the world itself can kill you just as fast as the tigers with blade arms. The volatile Royal's continent morphing effects keep the Zendikari from making much in the way of maps or civilizations. Also, there are stone diamond things all over the place. How mysterious. We know as little about Sorin as we do about Zendikar when we first see the both of them. He's grinning a smirk out at us from his incredibly black card, and if he can't steal your turn, he'll just steal half, or maybe even three quarters of your life instead, thanks. We know he's not from here, but we don't yet know why he is here on Zendikar. Across a couple of quotes in the block, he's judging this plane's vampires for their lack of restraint, and telling us tales of times he's seen entire worlds reduced to dust. What he's talking about and why he's here both become frighteningly clear in the last set in the block, Rise of the Eldrazi. Turns out Zendikar's actually a prison for some angry, evil gods who usually live in the space between worlds and devour entire planes when given the chance. They consume mana as well as life, and while Zendikar is abundant in both, those diamond things we've seen in the background of nearly every bit of card art for two sets now are actually all links in a great magical chain or net that's tethering the three ancient and powerful Eldrazi Titans into stasis on the plane. The constant land animating effects of the Royal are the plane itself's immuno reaction to the infection of the Eldrazi. You see, thousands of years before, Sorin was here. He and two other planeswalkers worked together to lure and then trap the Eldrazi on Zendikar having recognised the Titan's ability to literally eat worlds as a threat to the entire multiverse. We don't know the other two walkers at this point, but all three of them were needed back before planeswalkers lost their god-tier powers to contain the Titans on Zendikar. And there, imprisoned in a mountain and locked into stasis by the many, many diamond hedrons encircling the plane, the Eldrazi stayed for millennia. But alas, three unrelated idiots got duped by another mostly unrelated guy into releasing the lock on the Eldrazi Titans' prison. The Titans are shifting in their bonds and threatening to break free. Which, in Eldrazi terms, means they can spawn a bunch of smaller, annoying Eldrazi to annoy and eat you. With the Titans on the brink of escape, Sorin has returned to Zendikar to reseal the lock of the Eldrazi Titans' prison and keep the Eldrazi trapped on the plane. This adventure is told in the accompanying novel Zendikar, in the teeth of a coom, wherein Sorin employs the help of the native elf planeswalker Nyssa in order to reach the Eye of Ugin, the lock of the Eldrazi's prison. You'd think this might be a location known to Sorin, one that he wouldn't need help finding, given that he was involved with sealing the Eldrazi away in the first place, but apparently he's made himself magically forget the location of the Eye, because the plot needs to happen. In the teeth of a coom was not a good book. Nyssa and Sorin are both Deeply unlikable characters in this story. Nyssa sucks. She's just constantly negative and learns nothing throughout. Uh, except to trust her old prejudices, I guess. And her characterization has since been retconned. The story is told from her perspective, and Sorin is intentionally mysterious throughout. So we're not given much chance to learn who he is. He's aloof and mocking, save for when it comes to the mission, which he stresses the dire importance of. A chunk of the story about him places him at the centre of a mystery that I'm pretty sure has also been retconned. He uses song-based magic a few times in this book and then never again, and I enjoy the image of Sorin singing. None of the characters are likeable or like each other or form any kind of relationships, and the plot is just a series of incidental events along their journey to the eye. Nothing that happens in the story is relevant to anything that happens after it, except the end, so let's skip to that. Upon reaching the eye with Nyssa, she decides that Restoring the lock of the Eldrazi's prison, like Sorin wants, is a bad idea, and that if she just breaks it, then surely the Titans will just leave the plane, right? So she does, and they don't. 
the three Titans will probably just hang around for a bit, actually. At least until they've turned Zendikar into a barren wasteland populated by nothing but their abstract alien children before it dissolves entirely and they move on to do the same to every other plane in turn. Seeing that his plan has been turned against him, that all the work he's put in, both millennia ago and recently, has been dashed, and the Eldrazi are now completely free, and once again, a threat to the entire multiverse. Sorin does nothing, and washes his hands of the situation, and then fucks off. And then the book ends. Zendikar, and eventually everyone, will have to find a new saviour, because Sorin's tired now. Bye bye. Block over. So, did Sorin succeed in Zendikar block? He did not. Sorin came to Zendikar because he wanted to stop the Eldrazi from escaping. And instead, he led the person who set them free right to the place where she could do that. My sleeve fell down. It's not his fault, per se, that they got out. Or maybe it is. We'll get more into that later. But regardless, they got out as a result of his efforts, which is the opposite of what he wanted. I don't understand why Sorin even needed Nyssa with him. She doesn't know where the eye is herself. Both her and Sorin follow a guide who is not Nyssa. I think Sorin just has a thing for leading around younger female protégés, even though we will see how that continually backfires on him. Innistrad Block Outside of a few lines of flavour text and a reprint of his original card in Corset 2012, Sorin next appeared in Innistrad Block. This was the first time we were introduced to that plane, too. A uh, dark and spooky, European folklore-inspired world of gothic horror, where the only non-scary sentient race, humans, face off against everything else on the plane, which is constantly trying to murder them. Vampires and werewolves and ghosts and zombies and oh and my. If there ever was a plan for a novel tie-in for the original Innistrad, it seems that that was indeed cancelled, and the story is still told, just less satisfyingly, through a series of shorts and summary articles instead. This is Sorin's home plane, and the one place in the multiverse he feels any connection to. Sorin is the grandson of Innistrad's first vampire, Edgar Markov. In an attempt to save his people from starvation, Edgar created vampirism using angel blood at the behest of a demon several millennia ago. And so the first of what would go on to be the Grand Vampire Bloodlines was born, and by the time of the original Innistrad block, the vampires hold perhaps the most power of any group on the plane. Sorin was transformed by Edgar himself, all those millennia ago, and the trauma of the vampiric genesis caused Sorin's latent planeswalker spark to ignite. So for as long as Sorin's been a vampire, he's been a planeswalker too. This moment is depicted on the Commander 2017 printing of Blood Tribute, and it's stupid. Volkenbarger's work is routinely breathtaking, but this art has never made any sense. Sorin and Olivia's vampirically extravagant attires apparently aren't clothing choices they've come to over millennia of observing and contributing to decadent vampire fashion trends, or even constructed from elements gathered over thousands of years and maybe even worlds. No. Like a couple of fucking Simpsons, they've both been wearing the exact same clothes for over 6,000 years. That was supposed to be a joke about character design, and it sounded like a joke about The Simpsons never ending, and I guess it's both now. So Edgar created vampirism in an attempt to solve starvation, but Soren predicted that, ironically, starvation was where vampirism would lead them. Sorin saw that as the vampire families expanded, growing in power and encroaching ever further across the lands of Innistrad, the human population was diminishing. Eventually, Sorin predicted, the vampires would eat themselves out of resources and starve. In order to stop this, he enacted a plan that would put him at odds with nearly every other vampire on the plain. Innistrad's angels had always protected humanity. Much like Ravnica's, they have an innate sense of justice and a need to protect the weak. But the waning angelic forces were not enough to hold back the encroaching might of the vampires and the spooky extended family. Not until Sorin himself created the mightiest of the angels to lead them. The Archangel, Avacyn. Nigh unkillable and able to hear directly those who prayed to her in need, Sorin made Avacyn in an unrepeatable ritual, using his own blood, to defend humanity from those who would prey upon it, ultimately to save those who would prey upon it. Avacyn wielded a big old spear bearing her symbol, but her truest weapon was the Hellvolt. An eerie slab of silver sat atop a cliffside near the human capital. Taken by Sorin from Innistrad's mysteriously magical silver moon, the Hell Vault was a prison. On the inside, it was a lightless void, much bigger than the outside would suggest, and any monster that Avacyn couldn't slay, she stuck in the Hell Vault. What cannot be destroyed must be bound. 
For years, Avacyn and the passive magic buff she provided the humans allowed them to flourish again and the church that built up around her became humanity's primary religious, political, and military power. And whilst the other vampires hated him for it, Sauron was content in the knowledge that he'd stopped Innistrad from eating itself. In Innistrad, Sauron's motivations became clearer. A whole book of Sauron couldn't teach us much about him, but the block without a book showed us who he is. Sauron cares about his homeworld enough to build an angel for it, enough to be willing to make all the other vampires on it despise him for protecting it. His card, this block, gives him the title Lord of Innistrad. And that's how Sauron sees himself, even if no one else does. As he isn't a lord in the typical sense, with lands and holdings, the vampires of his own bloodline hate him as much as the others do. Sauron presides over the plane in his own way, often from afar, by pushing it towards the direction he desires, into eternity. A grimly detached protector of the one place he cares about. This is why a black man a vampire would bother stepping in with a seemingly benevolent goal like stopping the Eldrazi, He's got somewhere to protect. Even if the Eldrazi took millennia to reach Innistrad, Sorin would live to see it. But anyway, all of this has been history to the block. Let's get into what happened in it. A little while before Innistrad block began, Avacyn disappeared. Without her magic to protect them, humanity began to diminish as the forces of darkness closed in tighter again. Sorin's plan was coming unwound. And so after washing his hands of a threat to the entire multiverse that he swore to make his responsibility, he returns to Innistrad, just in time for the set. My bonds have compelled me back to Markov Manor. To find his missing Avacyn and restore balance to the plane. Where is she whom I created, my guardian of order? It's his sole focus, it's the one and only reason he's here, and he will stop at nothing to find her. I will find you, and those who block me will answer to my sword. So how does he do it? He mills about off-screen for two sets, accomplishing nothing. And then someone else finds Avacyn, accidentally, with no input or communication from Sorin. Liliana Vess, who also likes Innistrad and is better at actually achieving things than Sorin, broke the Hell Vault open to kill a demon that was in it, and incidentally freed Avacyn, who was stuck in there unbeknownst to almost everyone. What a twist! The missing hero that was just introduced was in the mysterious prison that was just introduced. Who could have seen that coming? Avacyn, my angel. What has befallen you? Well, apparently not Sorin, who made both of those things and probably could have foreseen this as a potential eventuality, yeah? Because with that in mind, you'd think he might have actually done something noteworthy to find his Avacyn, instead of nothing that was worthy of noting in any of the Innistrad story articles. So the hell has gone and Avacyn's restored. The last sets named that and everything. Humanity has a fighting chance again. Balance and hope return to Innistrad. Sorin's goal was actually accomplished, even if he didn't do anything to help achieve it. So can we give him a win for the block? Well, no, because he didn't do anything. This might be the block where we learned the most about Sorin, his homeworld and his past, but he perhaps does less in the Innistrad story than in any other. This is likely a result of that book cancellation, but him saying, I will find you, is pretty much the extent of the efforts we see. Maybe Sorin beat up Tybalt during this period, but that has no bearing on anything, and Tybalt is renowned for being weak. I suppose making Avacyn and arguably the Hell Vault were things Sorin achieved, but those were in the past and therefore don't count. Plus one got stuck in the other, essentially rendering them both useless, and that seems like an oversight. In the original Innistrad block, Sorin came looking for Avacyn and in no way contributed to her finding whatsoever, despite being the person who had the best chance of figuring out where she was because he made it. And her. Fail. Lily can have his point. Khans of Tarkir. The next time Sorin appeared, it was again for the first set of a brand new plane. Tarkir was a world influenced by Asian history, where planar supremacy was contested between five immense clans, each led by a Khan. So the set was called Khans of Tarkir. Sorin went to Tarkir in search of the mysterious Ugin, a planeswalker and one of the three that helped seal the Aldrazi away on Zendikar with Sorin all those millennia ago. Now that his business on Innistrad has been concluded for him, Sorin's finally realised that given how they're going to eat the multiverse, the Aldrazi aren't really something that he can wash his hands of, and that he's actually going to have to do something about them after all. And what he's going to do about them is get someone else to do something about them. When we first heard about the three walkers that trapped the Aldrazi, Sorin was the only one whose identity we knew. An unnamed and unknown Lithomancer had built the Hedrons, and slightly less mysterious than them was Ugin, the spirit dragon. Still a very enigmatic figure, he was clearly crucial to the Eldrazi's ceiling, and referenced a few times across several years, but with little information offered aside from an affinity for colourless manner. 
Everyone was as excited to meet him in Sorin's revelation as Sorin was to get out of doing any work. But when Sorin arrives on Tarkir, he finds that the spirit dragon is already dead and has been for ages. Balls. Sorin has no idea how or when it happened, and upon finding out, he only has one thing to say. We're all doomed. And maybe he also says this. Here you lie then, Ugin. The corpses of worlds will join you in the tomb. I guess Sorin really didn't have any idea of what he was going to do on his own, and finding Ugin really was his only plan. At least he's recognising the threat of the Eldrazi again, even if it is just to abandon all hope. And whilst Sorin's on Tarkir, he makes himself a guide out of a Tima clan hunting pie that he kills down to one reanimated vampire thrall, who then leads him to Ugin's bones. The guide is the vampire token he makes. See? And maybe this is a problem? Tarkir does have some vampires of its own, but they're weirder and definitely less common than Innistrad's. When Sorin makes his guide, I don't think it's a typical vampire siring, when a vampire of Innistrad will convert a human by mixing blood. Sorin kills Sorects that guy into a vampire with ranged blood magic. So I can't really tell whether that guide that he leaves on Tarkia is just gonna die soon, or is like a vampire eunuch, or if Sorin might have just introduced to Tarkia the same vampiric disease that crippled his home plane to the point where he had to make a bloody angel to step in. I don't know, and I don't think Sorin cares, to be honest. He really doesn't give a shit about anywhere other than Innistrad. So did Sorin succeed in Khans of Tarkia? Well, he did technically find Ugin, but given that his reaction to discovering Ugin's bones was to declare the multiverse a lost cause, I'd say that Sorin was hoping to find more than a corpse. Sorin went to Tarkir to get Ugin to do something about the Eldrazi for him, and instead might have given Tarkir its own plain crippling vampiric curse before finding Ugin long dead without having any idea how it happened to him or what to do next, and then abandoned all hope. That's called losing. Prequelude 1. It's supposed to be like prequel mixed with interlude. You get it. In the middle of Khan's block, Commander 2014 was released, and with it came five new Planeswalker cards, all featuring characters from Magic's history, and also this guy. There was one for each colour, and the white one was a woman named Nahiri the Lithomancer! Oh my god! This is her! This is the last member of the team! This is the mysterious Lithomancer who hung out with Sorin and Ugin all those millennia ago, and built the Hedrons that imprisoned the Eldrazi. We finally get to know who she is! My excitement is at maximum. I know I always sound sarcastic, but this was actually really exciting. A few short stories were published to go with the Commander decks, and the aptly named The Lithomancer by Kelly Diggs paints us a picture of who Nahiri was. Is? Was? Is? Anyway, Sorin's in it, so we're looking at it. The story follows Nahiri's perspective 6,000 years prior to Khan's block, before the three sealed the Eldrazi away, and opens with her and Sorin's last attempts to protect the final survivors of an unknown world soon to succumb to the Eldrazi. Contrasted against Sorin's black manner disregard for the plains people, Nahiri is very white manner in her perspective as she tries desperately to use her stone magic to erect defences and weapons for the doomed denizens. Nahiri's got like earthbender powers, but on cool drugs. She can control the earth and do this kind of stuff, but also create intricate designs like the inscribed hedrons, and even pull fully forged blades from stone. Although it doesn't matter how many battlemen she raises, not raises, or swords she hands out to the dying plains people in its final hours, her and Sorin have to planeswalk the hell away, like Sorin's been suggesting, as the Eldrazi overwhelm the defences and the plane dissolves into dust as it's entirely consumed. The pair return to Zendikar, where Nahiri is native to. She's a core! They have white skin and like ropes! The planeswalkers are met on Zendikar by Ugin, for the first time it seems at least for Nahiri. Nahiri, this is Ugin, called the Spirit Dragon. He's as old as time and about as easy to argue with. Ugin's also been watching the Eldrazi and proposes a plan. To lure all three onto a single plane and then contain them. Nahiri and Sorin agree, but the question of which world to use as a prison hangs in the air. Nahiri's white manner sense of duty outweighs her reluctance and she offers Zendikar as the jail and herself as the jailer. A quick montage of 40 years of Hedron construction takes us to the end of the story and the three planeswalkers standing triumphant as the Eldrazi titans are frozen in place and the mountain grows around them. So that's the story of how the Eldrazi were imprisoned. The three walkers said, we should do it, and then they did. As simple as the plot is, Kelly Diggs does an excellent job presenting the three walkers' relationships in this story. Sorin and the Spirit Dragon seem to be semi-reluctant acquaintances, but Ugin and Nahiri meet here, and Nahiri always regards the ancient and mysterious Spirit Dragon with a degree of scrutiny. She was much closer to Sorin. Nahiri wasn't a planeswalker for very long before she met Sorin, and he was something of a mentor to her. Sorin's nearly a thousand years her senior, and his teaching methods could be pretty cruel, but despite this, Nahiri comes to think of Sorin as a friend. 
Well done, Nahiri, said Soren. This was your work, your sacrifice. Soren's not actually in any of the decks for Commander 2014, so I'm not going to grade him right now, and he didn't really fail at anything. Unless you count not stopping the Eldrazi on that doomed world. I do want to point at Sorin though, as the most useless of the Free Walkers when it comes to their efforts to trap the Eldrazi. Ugin is the mastermind of the plan. He potentially designed the Hedrons and showed Nahiri the draconic runes she would inscribe onto them. He has a deep understanding of colourless mana, of which the Eldrazi are, and the Eye of Ugin, the lock of the Titan's prison, can only be opened with his invisible ghost fire. Nahiri dedicated her entire life to the goal of imprisoning the Eldrazi. She offered her world as their prison, she spent 40 years making Hedrons, and far, far longer watching over the imprisoned aliens. And Sorin, well, this is directly from the text. Sorin counted their life-draining power with his own, leeching their strength before they could take too much of Zendikar's vitality. Gold starred Sorin, which is different from a point, to be clear. I'm sure all that life draining stuff was absolutely crucial, and they definitely needed you specifically. While trapping the Eldrazi on Zendikar, Ugin learned little from Sorin. Anyway, nil point. No score change for Sorin, but you can add one point to your own internal context scoreboard. Mm. Dragons of Tarkir. So the Tarkir storyline involved a bunch of nonsense that we don't need to go into, except for the fact that this guy went back in time 1,000 years and made it so that Ugin didn't die after all. Thanks, Sarkin. Sorin can finally get someone else to solve his problems. So now that the timeline's been fucked with, Sorin never did find Ugin dead after all. In the new version of Sorin's obligated journey to Tarkir and the site of Ugin's bones, he instead finds Ugin's Hedroni cocoon, where the spirit dragon's been recovering for the last 1,000 years, instead of being dead. Sorin shouts an ancient word of unmaking, the cocoon collapses, and Ugin's back, baby! Sorin doesn't miss a beat to try and dump the blame of the Eldrazi's escape on Ugin, but the spirit dragon only wants to know one thing from the vampire. Where exactly Nahiri is. Cuz yeah, where is she? Surely the person Sorin should have gone to first to be the one who builds the Eldrazi imprisoning Hedrons. Seems like if he'd gone with her to Zendikar instead of Nyssa, the Eldrazi wouldn't have even gone out. So where on earth is Nahiri? Ugin's question brings something resembling an emotion to our stoic vampire. The notion of shame had long since evaporated from Sorin. Over the millennia, Sorin's human frailties and neurosis had grown, blossomed, and withered away. He was as immune to regret as he was to old age. And yet, for the first time in years, an uncomfortable feeling grew within him. An unpleasant itch, the sense that he was responsible, solely, for something important going awry. It wasn't remorse exactly, just a dull, discordant echo ringing in the space where remorse had once resided. Ugin stresses Nahiri's crucial importance to the situation while Sorin dodges the question, and it becomes pretty clear that Sorin knows a lot more about Nahiri's whereabouts than he's letting on. Ugin's neck pleats fanned in irritation. Speak facts, you vague thing. She's dead? No, said Sorin. She lives. The fuller extent of the truth was not something Ugin needed to know at this time, in Sorin's estimation. The dragon senses that the other two members of his alliance have had a falling out, and so he tells Sorin to stop being a baby man, go and bloody get Nahiri already, and bring her to Zendikar, and Sorin pouts like a baby man before begrudgingly agreeing, as the story ends. Alright, it's points time. Sorin was trying to find Ugin, just like when he was here in the older timeline, which didn't actually happen because we're in the new time, just like earlier, except this time, Sorin actually found him alive! Mission accomplished! Surely that's worth a point, eh? Well, nah. No. He's not getting it. Because this is my video, and my bullshit rules, and he doesn't bloody deserve it. Sorin's goal is to stop the Eldrazi. He came to Tarkir because he knows Ugin is his only hope of stopping them. And when Sorin's only hope asked Sorin directly for information that's crucial to their shared goal of saving the multiverse, Sorin was vague and elusive, hid that crucial information, and tried to steer their efforts toward a direction that best serves him. He doesn't get a win point because he woke a dragon up, he gets a lose point because he directly stood in the way of his own goals by hiding the truth from Ugin. He didn't even go and get Nahiri afterwards like he said he would, he just went back to Innistrad. And also, just like in the Innistrad block, he didn't bloody do anything. And someone else solved Sorin's problems for him, again, with no involvement or communication from him. Again. So just like with Avacyn, I'm giving his point to the one who actually did something. Here you go, Sarkin. You win this one, have Sorin's point on me. I won't even bring up all that 
untold suffering you caused. This time around, Sorin did drink all the blood from his vampire guide thrall before he left, so he probably didn't infect Tarkir with vampirism in the real timeline. At least that's what I thought, but if you look at the card Sorin's Guide from Corset 2020, the guy it depicts is definitely from Tarkir, and he's definitely a vampire, but he's talking about his dragon lord Colahan in the flavour text. But that doesn't make any sense, because the guide thrall that Sorin made in the story said that their dragon lord was a Tarka. People don't have two dragon lords, so what is going on? Did Sorin's drained thrall survive and then go on to change clans and infiltrate Colahan's forces for some reason? This could depict a different person, but the card's called Sorin's Guide. If the drained thrall did die there like it looked, is Sorin making repeated trips to Tarkir and instead of buying a map is just vampiring and leaving guides all over the place with the potential potential to infect the entire plane? The answer is not relevant to the score, as Sorin doesn't care, and Tarkia's future doesn't feature in his ambitions or consideration in any way. I only include the speculation here as slander. Or is it libel? I, I wrote it, but then I said it. Sorin's a, Sorin's a fictional character. Maybe I should strike the previous failure from the record, seeing as the timeline has? No, absolutely not. The point of this is to show the chronology of Sorin's failures in our time, and this is how we got it, one after another. And we got to watch how the same Sorin fails in two different timelines in two different ways. Either by giving up or by hiding the truth from his allies, Sorin squeezes in a loss whatever the timeline. Plus that original timeline is still around even if we don't get to see it. Don't you want to enjoy the knowledge that the original and infinitely cooler Tarkir is still chugging along in the classic timeline? Well too bad! It's crawling with vampires. It's all vampires everywhere, all thanks to Sorin. And now it's been eaten by the Eldrazi he didn't stop. The end. Shadows over Innistrad. Sorin next appeared the next time we returned to his home plane of Innistrad. When we last saw the place, it was entering a new era of peace and prosperity for the human population. With Sorin's creation, Avacyn, the guardian angel, freed from her accidental stay in the Hell Vault and again able to beat back the forces of darkness. And things on the plane weren't too bad for a few months with the angels back in force, but by the time we see it again for Shadows over Innistrad, the entire world is gripped by madness and conspiracy. Shadows over Innistrad has two major themes, insanity and mystery. Everyone is going crazy and why is everyone going crazy? The human population's fear and paranoia is at maximum. More and more of them are turning to strange cults for security, whilst their institutions are turning on the people. Werewolves run rampant with waning control over their humanity, and the vampire's bloodlust is more frenzied than ever leading to ever more decadently deadly debauchery against a population that cannot sustain it. Many are seeking answers for the mass delirium, and the clues are there for those still sane enough to see them. Markov Manor, the home of Sorin's granddad and the most powerful vampire family, lies not just in ruins, but utterly obliterated. It's architecture ripped apart and violently rearranged by some magical force. The large and powerful Markov bloodline has been all but eradicated and its members can be found in the ruins, their bodies encased and protruding from the stone itself. On top of that, someone has recently erected strange stone cryptoliths all across the countryside, all of them pointing to the same location, just off the coast. Worst of all this strange and terrible news is the fate of the angels. The madness that's affecting the earthly denizens of the plane is even more pronounced amongst its angelic protectors, and for the first time in Innistrad's history, the angels are turning on the humans. Avacyn's own instinctual moral grounding, which was previously influenced by all the loving and caring aspects of religion, has now flipped and is influenced by all the scary, judgmental aspects of religion. Where before, her desire to protect humanity was unending. Now, all she can see is their sins. That she would like cleansed from her plane, thank you very much. Her angelic forces and the church that worship her have both followed suit and root out heretics on threadbare accusations, or simply just burn towns to the ground in the name of angelic peace. Some of this comes to a head at the end of the Shadows of Innistrad story, where Sorin, who isn't the protagonist, he shows up briefly in the middle and then again at the end, is forced to make a terrible decision. Sorin had created Avacyn, so it was a cruelty beyond imagining, a pain beyond description that it fell upon him to end her forever. In the cathedral where she was made, Sorin casts a spell that will unmake Avacyn forever. So you know I'm probably not going to give him a win for the set. To be fair to the guy though, she was about to kill two other undeserving planeswalkers, and while Sorin definitely doesn't care about them, silence, he snaps, and the demons jolt with the force of his voice. He turns to me again. Listen to me. If you have some grievance with these two, you may kill them before we begin. The two fiends look at each other. 
He really had no choice in the end. Avison had always been Sorin's tool. Even if he pretends to himself he thinks of her as a daughter. Avison's actions had always been dictated by her instinctive morality that Sorin had a hand in making, seemingly above any free will she might have had. During their final confrontation, Avison comes to a clearer-headed realisation. Recognising both the horrors she's committed and her status as Sorin's pawn, Avison places the blame for her unforgivable actions squarely at her maker's feet and concludes that he will pay in blood. Alas, unable to beat Sorin by his design, the defeated Avison decides that rather than be reborn, as the vampire suggests, she can no longer live as the tool of such a monster and would sooner die by his hand. Sorin anguishedly obliges. I feel bad giving him a loss for this set, as he ultimately kind of did the right thing, question mark. Avison saw returning to her role as slavery, and at least Sorin gave her the end she chose. Plus, Sorin's maybe the only one who can kill Avison, and the situation that's affecting her sanity has not changed, so she'd probably go right back to kill him. Maybe he could have, like, tied her up for now? But I guess who knows how that might have gone. We don't see Sorin much in this story before the anguished unmaking, but when we do, he isn't desperately trying to save his Avison or restore planar balance. He's gathering an army for whatever's coming next. But where was Innistrad's protector when it needed him? Considering that after his chat with Ugin, Sorin didn't go to Zendikar as instructed and just went back to Innistrad, what was he even doing on his home plane if not attempting to prevent everything that was already happening there? Did he just not notice? How did Sorin let his homeworld get to this state? Sorin might have made the right choice with Avacyn in the end, but it came to pass because of his previous failures that we're getting into real soon, and Avacyn's death is a huge loss for Sorin and his plane, so it's definitely going on the board. As much as Avacyn's killing hurts Sorin and his grand plan for Innistrad, it does little to solve the plane's problems. There's just one less angel flying around murdering folk. Admittedly the most powerful one, but all that bad stuff is still going on and the plane is still tearing itself apart. Most people have no idea why any of this is happening, or who's doing all this. But Sorin knows. And so did the 2016 audience for the most part at this point, but I have withheld that information to build suspense. The cause of all this horror. The architect of the cryptoliths and the Drownyard Temple they point to. The destroyer of the Markov Manor and Bloodline and the warper of everyone's minds was Nahiri. Prequelude 2. A few stories published between Tarkir block and the end of the Shadows block show us how it all came to this. We open with Nahiri, 5,000 years after the Eldrazi were imprisoned, which is 1,000 years before Shadows of Innistrad. Long before the Hellvolt blew up, or Sorin accidentally freed the Eldrazi, Nahiri left the then intact personified Zendikar in search of her old pal Sorin. You see, the magical bonds of the Eldrazi's prison had then recently been loosened, which we know allows them to spawn teeming hordes of littler ones that tear across the land. The interplanar beacon that would summon her two allies, as per their word, was activated, and Nahiri set to work cramming the Eldrazi back in the Hedrons. At no small effort, she did just that and resealed the prison, but her friends never came. Now, Ugin was dead or uh, cocooned at this point, so that's his excuse, but Sorin didn't show up either. So a little sad and a little worried, Nahiri left her homeworld for Innistrad to find her mentor and learn what had impeded him. When she arrives on Innistrad to find out what could have happened to Sorin that would mean he would break his promise, she finds him seemingly completely fine. Nahiri explains the situation and asks why he didn't show up like he said he would, and Sorin says he didn't even get the message. He realises aloud that in making the Hellvolt, which was new at the time, and other related planar protections for Innistrad, he likely blocked out Nahiri's signal. Nahiri is concerned as to why Sorin would make something that could block out the signal he agreed to respond to, but Sorin is not concerned with her concerns. His callousness regarding the situation hurts Nahiri, and the difference in their perspective comes into sharp focus for her. It hit her then. The imprisonment of the Eldrazi had become her life's work, a constant effort that had kept her bound to her plane for almost her entire existence. But for him, it had been an eye blink. Forty years of mild effort 5,000 years ago, in exchange for millennia of peace of mind. And now, with his new countermeasures, perhaps Innistrad wasn't in danger. Perhaps Nahiri and Zendikar and a hundred million carefully placed Hedrons had served their purpose in the mind of Sorin Markov. Nahiri tells Sorin how betrayed she feels, and Sorin is a big vampiric dick about it and dismisses her and the situation. And that makes Nahiri act like a dick and threateningly demand Sorin return with her to Zendikar, but that doesn't go great. So Nahiri kicks off and they trade a few blows, and then Avacyn shows up to defend her creator, 
but an ancient planeswalker is more powerful than even the hyper-strong Avacyn. So before Nahiri can do any lasting damage to the angel, and thereby the plane, Sorin shoves her into the bloody hell vault. His silver prison TARDIS slab. Damn you, she screamed. I trusted you. I never asked for your trust, child. Only your obedience. And there she stayed. For a thousand years. A lightless, surfaceless void. With nothing but your fellow inmates, who were demons, for company. Within hours of her confinement, Nahiri calls out to Sorin that she's had enough and that he's won. That she's learned her lesson and that she'll return to Zendikar and leave Sorin alone. But no one could hear her. So Nahiri waited. And waited. And seethed. And prayed for her world and clung to her sanity for a millennium in sensory deprivation. Forgotten by the multiverse. But as we already know, a couple of years back from the Shadow story, in the original Innistrad block, Liliana blew up the Hell Vault. And you know, Avacyn got out because she was in it, but Nahiri got out too. The moment she's free, Nahiri flees and planeswalks to Zendikar for her safety and her worlds and the multiverses. And because home is the only place she has the strength to run to. She arrives to devastation. Scoured and stripped of life, an entire continent of Zendikar has been rendered to dust and husk by the Eldrazi. On the horizon, the Titans themselves walk free. Like they have since Sauron fucked it up with Nyssa at the beginning of the video. And Nahiri knows her world is dead. If she had no preparations, a thin shard of her old power, and a Hedron network centuries out of true alignment, while she was in the Hell Vault, the mending of the multiverse, where all the planeswalkers were depowered, happened unrelatedly off screen. So she went into the vault as a nigh invulnerable god of stone magic and came out as a very mortal, much less powerful mage. With her powers vastly diminished, her allies abandoning or betraying her, and her life's work rendered to dust, Nahiri loses all hope for Zendikar and her quest. With nothing left to lose, all Nahiri wants is to take from the man whose carelessness and cruelty let this all happen. As Zendikar has bled, so will Innistrad. As I have wept, so will Sorin. This I swear on the ashes of my world. So a little while before Shadows Over Innistrad, Nahiri returned to Sorin's home plane to plant the seeds of her revenge. The cryptoliths that she built across the countryside were designed to disrupt the plane's mana ley lines to focus at a single point, a great big, delicious point, but with dire consequences for the sanity of Innistrad's inhabitants. None more so than the angels who are mana. And also she just obliterated the Markovs at some point because they have Sorin's name and she doesn't know they hate him. But even Avacyn's death and everything that's happened so far is just fallout from the stepping stones of Nahiri's revenge. The cultists and the mana are still massing at the Drownyard Temple as the waves crash against it. And Shadow's Block has one set left to go. Let's see what happens in Eldritch Moon. Right after we evaluate Sorin. These are prequel stories that happen outside blocks, so I won't grade him as per my arbitrary bullshit. And Sorin didn't lose the conflict with Nahiri, even if he did lose a friend by imprisoning her for a thousand years. Most importantly though, these events reframe a bunch of earlier ones with some horrible, horrible context. This is obviously why Sorin was so evasive with Ugin, as he didn't want to admit to him that he'd bloody locked Nahiri up. If Sorin had his way, she'd still be in the Hellbolt. I'm not even sure the Hell Vault had the function to release someone. But this also makes it pretty clear that when Sorin showed up in the original Zendikar block to stop the Eldrazi, the reason he took some random elf with him, who messed it up for everyone, instead of trying to get Ugin, like he should have, was because he wanted to cover his tracks. He was trying to put this all to bed before the dragon could realize what he'd done to Nahiri and how much of a fuck up he is. And in doing so, he fucked it up even more, and only then, with the Titans free on the plane, did he come crawling back to Ugin to try and fix it. You know, right after briefly writing the whole thing off to go fruitlessly look for his angel. Eldritch Moon. So Innistrad's pretty fucked right now. The cryptoliths are still a pointin', the manor's still a massin. Everyone's still getting crazier and now fleshier than before. The purpose of the great big mana snack off the coast is revealed as the interplanar bait that it is when a fish that would make Qui-Gon Jinn reevaluate finally bites. Emrakul, the Aeon's Torn, the promised end, the largest and most terrifyingly powerful of the three Eldrazi Titans, emerges from the Drownyard Temple drawn in from Zendikar across the space between worlds by the big, delicious beacon Nahiri has made for her. The thing that Sorin has been trying to avoid the most has happened. The Eldrazi are on Innistrad. Rather than spawning endless brood like her two smaller siblings, Emrakul's influence warps the living into a shape and mindset 
more befitting the alien god's desires. Whether the living, vampires included, they aren't undead on Innistrad. Whether the living have been driven mad by the cryptoliths or Emrakul's approach up to this point isn't clear, but now that Emrakul's here, it's only getting much, much worse. More and more and more of any species with a heartbeat is dancing to Emrakul's tune and morphing into things that look like the thing from the thing. The apocalyptic jellyfish is drifting across the land, warping its inhabitants as she floats toward the human capital. Nahiri, her goal accomplished and her plan nearly at fruition, gathers an army of the mad cultists that have come to worship her, takes them to the ruins of Markov Manor, and waits. Just as she promised, Innistrad is bleeding and it's soon to run dry. Sauron knows he can't kill the Titan. He's got no idea how to make Hedrons and no Hellvolt left if Emrakul could even fit in him. And Sauron is faced with a choice that will come to define him. Go and fight the Titan with the gathered few that are trying to save his world, or take his revenge. This world is ruined, Sauron said. She has made sure of that. Sauron Markov, the Lord of Innistrad, its self-claimed protector against threats both planar and extraplanar, forsakes his homeworld to go and try and kill Nahiri. Sorin puts an old feud with the head of the now most powerful vampire family on hold to get her to rally a vampire army for him. Not to kill a god, but to kill an old friend and her gathered cultists. And in the ruins of Sorin's family home, they clash. And it's fucking sick, mate. It's dope. It's rad. It's pang. Nahiri's like smashing vampires in the face with bits of marble and deflecting Sorin's death magic back at him. And at one point, she makes a bunch of swords and sticks them in all the walls until the whole building is vibrating and rotating around to reveal a hidden room into which she's pre-stuffed a bunch of Eldrazi horrors that spill out and devour everything in sight, except for Nahiri, because she's done a cool magic thing. And really, Sorin is on the back foot for almost the entire time. This is a man we've seen single-handedly kill entire hunting parties on Tarkir, and scores of Eldrazi spawn. Earlier in this block, he killed a group of vampires in a heartbeat and was hacking angels to bits, but here, he's battered around by the Lithomancer and then saved by some vampires and then battered around some more. Sorin's walked right into Nahiri's trap. Literally. He walked right in to a fight with a stone mage in a stone building with nothing but a buffer of vampires for whatever Nahiri was planning. And she had centuries to think about revenge. After Sorin gets a couple of hits in and finally wraps his fangs around her neck, Nahiri brings the walls crashing into the pair of them, slipping out of the stone herself unharmed and leaving Sorin stuck, immobile, in a chunk of wall. There was no planeswalking from this. The stone teeth that held him chewed at his insides, keeping him in a perpetual anguish that would sap the focus he would need to leave this place. I'm not sure if I buy that. Isn't anguish something that usually makes you planeswalk rather than not be able to? But it doesn't matter. He's not getting out of that wall. Yet. Nahiri spins Sorin's block around so he can see Emrakul on the horizon, gloats herself on the back for a revenge well executed, and leaves. And there, Sorin's stuck. Oh, but he was with that vampire lady who brought all the other vampires, right? Maybe she'll help him out. Sorin didn't like the way Olivia looked at him as he spoke. She was a spider, and he was a fly. Listen to me, he tried again. What good is any of this if it'll be gone tomorrow? Avison is dead, and you, she said, pressing the point of his own sword against his cheek. You're where you are? I think it's quite good. And all Sorin could do was watch as Olivia floated from view, so that Emrakul and the end she promised filled his vision once again. And that might have been the end, or worse, for our poor Sorin and the rest of Innistrad, were it not for a group of plucky adventurers who banded together at the last minute to do Sorin's job for him. Again. Jace is the protagonist of this story, so he goes and gets his pals to help out, and they all show up to save the day. And Liliana even helps, because she likes Innistrad, and maybe Jace, and Lily's usually all about not helping with stuff. It's handy too, because she's a necromancer, and Emrakul can't control the dead, you see. But all the effort in the world would have gone to waste, as Emrakul proved too powerful for anyone to handle. But just as all seems lost, Emrakul says, fuck this, and fuck you, you're not worth my time, and I didn't like Innistrad anyway. This is all wrong. I am incomplete, unfulfilled, inchoate. There should be blossoms, not barren resentment. The soil was not receptive. It is not my time. Not yet. She takes her ball and goes home. Sorry, goes and makes the ball her home through some tricky bullshit that was actually really cool. I liked it. 
It sounds like a cop-out, but it was actually well written. It's just too confusing to explain right now. Emrakul traps herself, Hellvolt style, inside Innistrad's silver moon. And there, in the moon, she waits till this day. Huzzah? Innistrad is safe? Uh, for now? Question mark? This is all obviously ominously part of Emrakul's unknown plan, but it seems like everyone's safe from being mind-warped and Cronenberged, for the minute at least. It's probably not great to have an Eldrazi in your moon, but it's better than having one not in your moon, and Innistrad and Sorin are gonna keep on kicking. Although, Sorin can't do much kicking right now. All he can do is wince and avert his eyes as I bring up the scoreboard. In keeping with precedent, I'm obliged to give Emrakul the win point for this set, for saving Sorin's plane from herself whilst he was busy. Regardless of her eldritch motivations, Emrakul makes it onto the board, and into the ranks of the people who unknowingly did Sorin's job for him. But in terms of how Sorin scored? Oh, it didn't go well for him this time, did it? Sorin's homeworld, the one place he cares about, the plane he swore to protect, came crashing down around him while he sat helpless in a wall, thinking about what he'd done. And it was only through his repeated saving grace, other people solving his problems for him, with no involvement or communication from him, that his plane and him were saved from annihilation. Worse, while I don't want to blame Sorin for Nahiri's crimes, all of this world-shattering chaos came about as a result of Sorin's cruelty. Now, during their confrontation a thousand years back, Nahiri was the first to threaten violence, which is pretty bad, but it all became a case of disproportionately escalating responses. Sorin didn't respond to the signal, so Nahiri said, What the fuck, bro? So Sorin was a dismissive dickhole, so Nahiri did some violence. So Sorin sicked his angel on her, so Nahiri nearly killed it. So Sorin locked Nahiri in hell indefinitely, so Nahiri did a genocide. She definitely comes out the bad guy even next to Sorin, but Sorin pushed her down the road that led to his destruction. Nahiri was ready to concede soon after she was imprisoned, but it really seems like Sorin would have just left her in the Hell Vault forever if it wasn't blown up, and locking someone in sensory deprivation, which is torture, for a thousand years whilst their life's work crumbles and their world dies, is probably gonna leave whoever you do it to in a state where they want to kill you and everyone you love. It doesn't seem smart for the Lord of Innistrad to make this kind of enemy for the plane. Sorin at least tells Nahiri that he considers the Hellvot a mercy, but really, he just cooked her into a villain for a thousand years in the revenge oven. Nahiri was in the wrong, to be clear, at all points in their confrontation, beyond saying, what the hell, man. But Sorin leaving her in the vault for so long was a profound cruelty, with profound potential to come back and bite him in the ass. You'd think a man with so many grudges would have understood that. Most damning of all the decisions that led him to be walled, was the moment he failed the ultimate test of his character and chose his revenge over his plane. Proving that although he's often white-black, he is indeed black to the core, and white has only ever represented the obligations that he's bound to that he will drop in favour of himself. I do wish this moment was depicted in text or cards somewhere, the decision to forsake Innistrad. At some point between these two points, Sorin decides that Innistrad is lost and he'd rather have a pop at Nahiri. We don't get much opportunity to see Sorin's mindset this story. Regardless, the wall Nahiri sticks him in really is the bed he made for himself. The throne the Lord of Innistrad deserves. Eldritch Moon was the culmination of a story that had spanned seven real-world years, from the release of Zendikar, with the introduction of the Eldrazi and Sorin in 2009, to Emrakul and Sorin's imprisonment in 2016. Whilst I'm sure we'll see Eldrazi again, and Sorin has appeared since this story, this was the end of a significant arc for both of them. This is the defining moment for Sorin's character. Trapped in a prison of his own reflected cruelty, forced to watch the plane he vowed to protect crumble around him, the culmination of every decision he's made so far. Set by set, we've seen Sorin approach every problem that comes to him in whatever way can suit him the best. Circumventing his allies' efforts in favour of his own benefit and dodging multiverse-spanning responsibilities. Half of his failures are the result of his inaction and poor decisions, and the other half could have been avoided if he just wasn't such a dickhole. In Eldritch Moon, all of Sorin's mistreated chickens come home to roost with a vengeance. The responsibility he's been desperate to avoid is brought to his door by the subject of his abuse, but this time, he's powerless to slink away. In Eldritch Moon, Sorin didn't just fail. Failure was branded onto his soul. One point is a mercy. War of the Spark. 
Okay, so Sauron didn't show up for a couple of years until War of the Spark, which was the culmination of another big arc that had been unfolding over several years, mostly involving other characters. It's basically not relevant, and it's got far too many moving parts to get into now, and I'm going to talk about it when I get back to the video that you probably wish that this was. Basically, in order to take over the multiverse, a bad dragon invaded the city world of Ravnica, and some people there activated an interplanar beacon that would annoy planeswalkers across the multiverse into showing up on Ravnica, to help stop the dragon. But that was actually what the dragon wanted, so he trapped all the planeswalkers on the plane so he could eat their power and become a god. This was Magic's Infinity War endgame style event set, and it was planeswalker themed, so it had a billion planeswalkers in it when most sets have two or three. So a huge chunk of Magic's planeswalker cast was drawn to Ravnica to get a new card in the set, and that included both Sorin and Nahiri. The pair get cards and spells of their own for the set, and they duel across the plane as the war erupts around them. Anytime we see them, they're fighting and ignoring the larger conflict. Apparently at some point they stopped fighting each other and did help out, but we're not given much context for any of anything that happens and no perspective from either. Other more prominent characters just regard them in the background of the story. They're literally just background spectacle. Anyway, eventually the heroes prevail over the dragon. Hooray! Spoilers! And Soz and Na maybe contributed to it a bit, maybe? Before going their separate ways. And I kind of wish Wizards had just left it alone. It's not that annoying, and the imagery of the pair fighting against the Ravnican skyline is cool, but it feels weird to just see them doing the same thing they were doing the last time we saw them, but again, with less context and less stakes. Or well, there are higher stakes, but they're ignoring them. And how did Sauron get out of the wall? Fuck you, doesn't matter. Even if it would have been amazing to see him as a land or a wall. And how did he get his sword back? Shouldn't Olivia have it? Fuck you, doesn't matter. None of this matters. The two planeswalkers fighting goes nowhere and no one wins and nothing changes. And whatever they eventually did to help out was inconsequential enough that it can be summarized by they helped. Sorin drained the Eternals vitality before they could drain too much of the planeswalker. I won't even do a score change. Nothing happened. Sorin didn't beat or lose to Nahiri and then when helping did nothing specific enough to be mentioned and we know Sorin so it was probably as little as possible. Even if the bad dragon man was defeated there is no precedent whatsoever in this video for giving Sorin points for stuff other people did. But hey he didn't lose either so relatively nice job Sorin. In War of the Spark an annoying beeping sound annoyed Sorin into the same place as Nahiri so they fought and then they stopped and then they left. Course set 2020. Next time Sorin got a card, it was in Corset 2020, which came out in July 2019, obviously. Now, Corsets don't have associated stories, or they sometimes do, but this one didn't. So there's no context for this Sorin. It's just a new card, and it's not bad, but obviously there's nothing to evaluate here. Even more nothing than the last nothing that just happened, happened, or didn't. In Corset 2020, Sorin failed to do anything, so he gets a failing grade. Nah, I'm not that harsh. Don't you worry, Sorin. No score change, and in fact, strike it from the record. Off to the pile with the setless stories, you storyless set. Innistrad, Midnight Hunt. Back to Innistrad in 2021. Man, when you lay it all out, it's hard to not think magic's just repeating itself. It's a werewolf-ish themed set about day and night mechanics, even though the story's about how there's no daytime no more. Emrakul's presence in the moon is probably bad, actually, after all, and alongside a few reminders of her, the knights on the plane have unnaturally been getting longer and longer until the sun has become a memory. And that's bad for the humans and good for the spooky bunch. Everyone would love to take some more time to recover from Emrakul, but with Avacyn gone, the humans have little strength left in their old institutions and are easier prey than ever. In the absence of their structured religion, many are turning to forgotten cult magics from their own pre avicinian history and folk traditions. So this time around the humans have like a wicker man looking aesthetic. But nice, rather than scary. Cult, but nice. This power that the humans are tapping into emphasizes their community and the strength that they find in it. But as the night encroaches, the werewolves particularly are growing in number and size, smashing stuff and eating people because obviously because they're werewolves. Without the sun, eventually the humans will fall. Plus, I bet it's bloody cold. But they've got a plan. Okay, we need to make the sun come back and for day and night to be normal again, right? Well, thankfully, there's a thing that does just that. There's a great big mechanic magical contraption over there somewhere that no one's used for ages, but if we switch it on, it'll make the sun come back. The only thing we need to do to switch it on is channel our folk magics by having a great big party around and under it. Amazing, I'm all in. And the only other only thing we need to do to switch it on is Find the key. Yeah, it's locked. 
Gotta get the key to turn it on, but who knows where that is. Enter Planeswalker characters to come and find the key in what I'm sure will be a grand and exciting adventure. So the Innistrad native Planeswalker werewolf, but a nice one, Arlen, goes and gets some Planeswalker mates to help out, and they do, and they all follow a series of clues to find the key until the clues lead them to Sorin. Doing the vampire equivalent of moping in the remains of his family home. Brooding over his losses against Nahiri, Sorin's disposition is even more abrasive than the usual amount. The heroes approach him and ask him for the key to the thing, so they can stop the knight and the humans from being destroyed, and restore balance to the plane. And given Sorin's previous actions, the whole making Avacyn thing, you'd think he'd be right into that, but instead, he acts like a great big baby man. Again. I cannot expect someone so impetuous to understand how much I've sacrificed for this plane already. If my family, he practically snarls the word, so wishes to descend into the worthless hedonism of eternal night, then I have done enough to stop them. Let them feast. Innistrad is your family, Soren. We all know that. You've done more than enough. We're asking for the key so we can do our part. Is that so? He answers. Pray, tell me what you've done for the plane. Go on. I'm listening. Now he's advancing. Now the sword slips from its sheath. All the planeswalkers are just, can we have the key, pretty please, Soren? And Soren's all, no! No! Do you have any idea who I am? I shouldn't have to do more things. I'm sleepy. Fuck off. And in response, everyone's, you literally don't have to do anything. Just give us or tell us where the key is and we'll do everything for you. And Soren's just, no! No! <laughs> That's too much fun. Fuck you! Okay, okay. Jesus. Anyway, before Soren can start cutting people's heads off for trying to help Innistrad, the last surviving Archangel, Sagada, shows up out of nowhere and tells our heroes that the key's in Soren's drawer, because she knows that for some reason. Obviously, as Soren is in the middle of being a knob end, this pisses him off, and he decides... <laughs> he decides he's gonna fight Innistrad's last surviving Archangel. When Sorin recognized the need for Avacyn and made her, there were four other Archangels kicking about protecting the humans. And now that Avacyn's dead, humanity's basically fucked and there's only one Archangel left to stand up for them, he decides he's gonna fight her. Because he's angry. So they fight as Arlen and her mates go and get the key and that's the last we see of the angel or the vampire till next block. I'm not a huge fan of this story and I'm less of a fan of Sorin in it. I can believe that he'd be sulking after everything that's happened, but I don't believe this characterization. Where his selfish short-sightedness is pushed until it encompasses his entire being as he self-destructs. He's like a caricature of Sorin. This is season 9 of Friends Sorin. Sorin isn't just refusing to change, he's devolving. Before, he was content to let other people solve his problems for him. But now, he's actively stopping them from solving his problems for him. I guess when he's at his lowest, he doesn't even want to see anyone else save Innistrad. We know you don't want the humans to die out, Sorin. Why are you acting so belligerently against your own self-interests? Ah, it's not his fault he was badly written this time around. But it doesn't earn a win. Or even a nothing. It's definitely a failure. In Midnight Hunt, a group of people tried to further Sorin's goals for him, and he attacked them with a sword. Innistrad? Crimson Vow. So at the end of the last set, the human's ritual to restore the sun failed. At the last second, that vampire lady that lent Sorin an army and then left him in a wall a few sets back showed up and took the key and left. Olivia Voldaren likes the sound of Eternal Night, being the head of a vampire family and all. She's planning an important wedding, you see. It's a wedding set. A grand, lavish vampire celebration held with the purpose of cementing her currently tenuous position as the most powerful vampire on the plane. And her husband-to-be is the original vampire himself, Soren's granddad, Edgar Markov. Now, we found out in this story that Edgar spends the majority of his time asleep in the Markov family crypt under the manor, undisturbed even by Nahiri's machinations. But in the split second when Soren wasn't looking, Olivia nicked Edgar's coffin, woke him up, and magically charmed him into being her groom. With the Markov progenitor in her matrimonial thrall, she'll have control over the two most powerful vampire families and the others in allegiance, ruling them all as the Queen of the Endless Night. So the Planeswalker heroes from the last set want to stop her, because obviously all of that would be bad, and she still has the key they need for the thing! The day thing! They're gonna have to crash a wedding! But they'd like some help. Apparently having completely forgotten how it turned out just last set, they're gonna ask Sorin to help out. 
Sorin's still moping in his family home, but apparently finding Edgar missing was the motivation he needed to stop being a tit and pull it together finally. He's much more receptive when they show up this time around. He doesn't even punch any angels. Sorin's finally recognizing the Endless Knight as a problem he should probably do something about. He's actually gonna help out! Hooray, they all say. Let's devise a terrible plan together. The gathered defenders of humanity decide that they'll dress up all fancy and show up at the Voldaren estate and try to use Sorin's one invitation to all get into the wedding together. Doesn't matter that they only have one invite, and it doesn't matter that the only people invited to the wedding are vampires, and the only humans there are food. This is their plan. So obviously those things did matter, and the group is denied entry to the wedding at the gate, because obviously. So Sorin takes his one invite and heads in, and all the other idiots wait outside like we always knew they were going to, and we all wonder what function the inclusion of that plan had in the story other than making all our characters seem really, really dumb. Inside the estate, Sorin plays the role of wedding guest to the jeering and goading of all the other vampire guests that already hated him for making Avacyn. His invitation is basically an insult from Olivia, an opportunity to come and watch Innistrad slip from his grasp. On top of everything else bad that she's planning, Olivia's also gonna drink the blood of that angel that Sorin tussled with earlier, who's since been captured, and this will apparently allow Olivia to control angels? Because her already plain conquering plan needed even more stuff going on, I guess. With Olivia's matrimony to Edgar soon to be finalized, Sorin, the dutiful grandson, steps up and objects to the couple's pairing, and then is immediately restrained by the guards. But then he objects even better by making a sword out of the angel blood. And then a ghost shows up and frees the angel, and the dorks from outside come in and everybody's fighting everybody. Sorin pairs off with his granddad and tries to fight talk him around, but Edgar's too charmed and they clash as Edgar berates him as only a parental figure can, and then throws Sorin into a vat of blood. Sorin takes a minute and then remembers that he drinks blood and drinks his way out of the blood. He pursues Edgar, beats him up, nearly executes him for a second, thinks better of it, and tells him to get the hell out of my sight. So Edgar scampers off. Sorin doesn't try and de-charm him, he just Tells him to fuck off. Uh, problem solved, I guess. Jobs are good un. Oh, and the other good guys got the key off Olivia and took it to the day machine and made it so there was day again. Hooray! Job is a good one. I'm not in love with the story of our third trip to Innistrad. It's not in the teeth of a coom awful, but it's toothless and dull and convenient. The character's tone rarely feels appropriate, and there's just so many of them that they barely get any characterization. It's stressed that humanity is close to doomed, but all the planeswalkers act like they're on a fun holiday on Innistrad the whole time. Come and hang out on Innistrad, Kaya. There are ghosts there, and you like or hate ghosts, I can't remember which. Come and wear a new dress so you can stand outside of a wedding, Chandra. But one thing this story did that none of the others we looked at managed to do was actually make me like Sorin for a minute. Not in Midnight Hunt, but in Crimson Vow, Sorin got a lot more focus than he typically does, and we got to see things from his perspective for each chapter he was in. For the first time ever, his relationship to his grandfather was explored, and we learned that regardless of how the rest of the Markov line and the other vampires feel about Sorin, he's always stayed on good terms with Edgar. Now, Sorin might despise the reckless debauchery of Innistrad's vampires, but he sees them as tainting Edgar's legacy, rather than as a product of it. Unable to escape obligation wherever he goes, apparently, Sorin is charged with maintaining the Markov family crypt, a responsibility he resents for every one of them, save for Edgar. Periodically, across the last few millennia that Edgar's been sleeping, Sorin would wake his granddad to ask his advice, or to discuss the current state of Innistrad. Sorin attributes his perspective of seeing the bigger picture to his grandfather's teachings. He even sought Edgar's guidance when creating Avacyn. Sorin values what Edgar has given him, and always believed that he'd stayed within Edgar's vision for him. When Sorin objects to Edgar's pairing to Olivia, it seems to be out of genuine care for his granddad. He doesn't want to lose his grandfather. He doesn't want to see his grandfather get hurt. In all the plains, no one had known him longer. No one knew the story of his life so well. From his childhood to his ascendancy, his failures to his triumphs. No one else remembered anymore. All the others were dead. Ah, oh, see, there's not nobody that he cares about. Sorin loves his granddad. Well, that may well be true, but we also learned that despite how the vampire equivalent of his emotions have been characterized so far, Sorin is still holding on to the trauma associated with his transformation at Edgar's command all those thousands of years ago. 
From the memories that plague him during the Crimson Vow story, we see that Sorum was a less willing participant in his turning than we might have imagined from his decadently detached demeanour. Drink and be eternal, his grandfather said to him, as if he had any choice in the matter, as if he had wanted to be eternal. Sorin's turning at Edgar's hand marks the point at which he was adopted into an eternal cycle of abuse. You know, because vampire. And it's clear that some part of Sorin still feels guilt over his inclusion and anger at Edgar for inducting him. Sorin never chose to be a vampire, it seems, and as much as he respects Edgar's legacy, he can never escape it. These feelings are drawn to the surface when they fight at the end of the story, to the point where Sorin considers executing the defeated Edgar, if only for a moment. We're ultimately left unsure how Sorin feels about Edgar, or where their relationship will go from here, and this feels appropriate. Sorin doesn't kill Edgar, but he doesn't forgive him either. The writing does confuse this exploration of Sorin a bit, as the confrontation happens whilst Edgar's charmed, which kind of takes some of the impact out of it. Although, maybe not for Sorin. I wonder if you've ever had an original idea. For that matter, I wonder if any of your ideas have ever worked out for you. Oof, too accurate, Edgar. Regardless, Sorin's selfish black mana perspective is given context. It's how he was taught and literally made to be. Sorin's got more dimension to him than ever before, leaving the Crimson Vow story, and for once in this entire video, he actually won! Sorin finally stopped moping and remembered the reason he made Avacyn during this story, and he actually was instrumental in stopping Olivia's ceremony and helping humanity restore the day-night cycle. This time, he actually helped the people that were doing his job for him. He did some of his own job. And better than that, he stepped up to save his old gramps, but ended up defeating Edgar for himself. Maybe Sorin should have attempted to de-charm Edgar, but he was having a hard time dealing with all his conflicting emotions for his beloved but abusive grandfather right then. Although he might want to track Edgar down before Olivia grabs him for a quick shotgun wedding before the charm wears off. Either way, in Crimson Vow, Sorin helped save his home plane, saved Ish, his granddad, confronted his past, and stood victorious. And I couldn't be happier to finally give him a point. Finally give him one point. So is Sorin a failure then? Aw, oh, look at that. He managed to squeeze in a win before the end. Maybe that damages my premise slightly? No. No. Okay? No. Let's run down the scoreboard from the beginning to make me feel better. In original Zendikar, Sorin led to the Eldrazi's escape by taking the elf who freed them to their prison's lock instead of the allies he'd either imprisoned or was avoiding. That's a failure. In original Innistrad, Sorin tried to find his missing creation, Avacyn, and didn't. That's a failure. In Khans of Tarkir, Sorin discovered that the ally he believed was crucial to any hope of ever stopping the Eldrazi, Ugin, had already been dead for years. And then abandoned all hope of saving the multiverse. That's a failure. In Dragons of Tarkir, after someone else made it so that Ugin never was dead after all, and Ugin asked Sorin for information crucial to their shared multiverse-saving goal, he lied. Failure. In Shadows over Innistrad, Sorin did basically nothing to stop his plane being driven to destruction, and then was forced to kill his greatest creation, Avacyn, himself. Oof. Sorry, Sorin. That's a failure. In Eldritch Moon, Sorin chose his revenge over the plane he swore to protect underestimated and underprepared for the nemesis he made, was utterly defeated and left at the mercy of the monster god, destroying his world that he had no hand in stopping. Um, nice, so it's still only one point. In War of the Spark, Sorin and Nahiri needlessly fight, and I wish it didn't happen because basically nothing did. No score change. In Innistrad, Midnight Hunt, a caricature of Sorin, embarrassed himself and the audience by standing obnoxiously in the way of people trying to solve his problems for him before beating up an angel. Failure. Although in Crimson Vow, after saving his granddad and his world a bit, he did finally, finally succeed for once. Good showing at the wedding, Sorin, but the scores are still not in your favor. Across the nine sets where Sorin features, he succeeded just that once and failed in seven of them. It's not a good ratio. You've been ratioed, Sorin. You see, I proved it. It's proved. We're gonna have to christen him a failure. Like I already did in the title. Now, as much as I've shown you, and do indeed believe that's who he is, I don't think Sorin the vampiric fuck-up was the character Wizards intended to make when he first appeared in Ye Olde Zendikar. Sorin was always a conveniently black supporting character to utilize throughout the story, helping the plot run to interesting places by jamming his own selfish motivations in the way. But saddling this primarily black character with a bunch of interplanar responsibilities as they did, turned Sorin into a perfect expression of his two opposed colors ideologies. 
stuck between his altruistic white manner duties and his self-centered black manner nature. A black manner planeswalker with white manner problems. That and being a vampire are Sorin's whole deal. White represents his obligations, but black is how he approaches them, and ultimately, who he is. The reason I laid the video out the way I did, set by set, was to demonstrate the impression of Sorin that you're left with when, year after year, set after set, every time we see him, he always falls short of his goal. The Sorin of the past, the Sorin of his backstory, was a planar protector who contributed to and enacted grand plans that should benefit him into the infinity of his vampirehood. But the Sorin we see, the Sorin of the present, is letting those plans slip through his fingers to break apart around him. Unaware of the flaws in their construction that will lead to their undoing, seeking to maintain and restore them with the smallest, most self-serving efforts. Abandoning even the plane that is his charge to pursue lesser ambitions. His failures are the result of his self-skewed outlook's inability to deal with all the knots of accountability he's lived long enough to tie himself into. And those failures that amounted to everything he'd done so far, that were derived from his defining character elements, satisfyingly came to a conclusion in 2016. But Sorin's still here. By the time of Eldritch Moon, wizards looked at the character they'd made and the bed they'd made him make for him and gave him the ending he deserved. But as perfect an ending as that was for the character, it could never truly be his end. Magic Planeswalkers have become increasingly similar to superheroes over the years. Not just because of the powers, but in that, above their function as characters in a story, they act as pillars that prop up hugely profitable organizations. Planeswalkers don't just have to be characters, they have to be game pieces, and they have to be marketing focuses. They have to be sellable, enduring identities, in a way. You might get the occasional satisfying ending for a character, even in stories that aren't satisfying, but you're much more likely to see those characters keep chugging on forever, brought back beyond the point where their story ended to serve purposes greater than themselves. And Sorin's story ended in that wall. I'm not saying Sorin should have starved to death there. It's implied in Midnight Hunt that he clawed and chewed his way out of there, by the way, and that it was probably a painful escape. But the wall marked the end of a story that defined Sorin, and without a new direction, he's yet to move on from it. Now that could very well be what's in store for us. Kaya is the primary Orzhov planeswalker now, and Sorin's most recent card was Mono Black again. Maybe if he's freed from his old expectations, Sorin will be able to redefine himself. Whilst his characterization in the most recent Innistrad story wasn't anything I'd call the new Sorin, the depth that was given to him by K. Arsenal Rivera in Crimson Vow could lay the grounds for some new character growth and an interesting new direction for Sorin. Throughout the Crimson Vow story, we see Sorin begin to doubt things that he clearly hasn't for a long time. His mind is repeatedly flung back to his transformation, and his assurance in who he is wavers. During his confrontation with Edgar, when Sorin's wallowing in the vat of blood, he almost loses all faith in himself and is struggling to find a reason to go on. His grandfather's charmed attacks on his character leave him questioning Edgar's perspective. And here, sinking in blood, outside of Edgar's vision for him for the first time, Sorin feels truly alone. It's only by focusing on the anger he feels at Edgar for marrying Olivia and giving in to the fleeting power at odds with everything his grandfather had taught Sorin that Sorin is able to summon the strength to get out of the blood and pursue Edgar. It's a bit silly how past a certain point Sorin just readily accepts everything the granddad he knows his charm says at face value, and he's even willing to blame Edgar for agreeing to the wedding, but I do like how this newfound doubt causes Sorin to question the more ingrained injustices that were done to him. Of all the wounds Sorin bore, Edgar had inflicted the first, and still Sorin had loved him for thousands of years. Had that been part of his grandfather's plans too? To use Sorin only when convenient? To indulge all these long conversations as if indulging a child's tea parties? Sorin exits the Crimson Vow story with more questions for himself than answers, but seeing things outside of his grandfather's perspective for the first time leaves him even more disconnected to his lineage than before. Maybe Sorin's ready to entirely reject the whole vampiric power structure he was conscripted into, and emerge from it as someone new and actually capable of dealing with problems. The Lord Innistrad deserves. Whatever happens, Sorin will likely draw himself into obligation again. Even if it's just to maintain a comfortable world to relax on, we know he cares at least about the well-being of Innistrad. It's still his home. In Crimson Vow, when reflecting on his responsibilities, we see that other people's problems tire Sorin. But whether he'll move away from white or not, it's clear that some small part of Sorin wants to maybe not help people, but at least fulfill what he sees as his responsibility to them. Save us, they say to him. I'm trying, he wants to say. See? 
He wants to say he'll try. He even offered Markov Manor at the end of the Crimson Vow story as a refuge to the human survivors of the wedding. It's still obliterated, though he was trying to be nice. But the story also showed us that Sorin isn't necessarily effectively reflecting on how his past actions have come back around. When he thinks about Nahiri's crimes, he conveniently misses out his part in pushing her there. If he can't confront his part in it, perhaps he's destined to repeat the past. Maybe his vampirically dried up emotions leave him incapable of change. Or maybe whoever writes him next won't do a good job, or he'll need to fill the role allotted to him by his vampire-themed black-white planeswalker card slot. Because Sorin as he is cannot escape failure. He's defined by the dissonance of his two opposed colours, caught in the schism inherent in their pairing. With a perspective that can never truly approach the problems that will be inevitably thrust in front of him. Ever unable to fulfil responsibilities he's interminably bound to. Shaped by his shortcomings as much as he is by the vampire blood that immortalises them. Doomed to remain eternally inadequate. Unless they do something cool with him, I don't know. Welcome to the outro. Hi. Thanks for making it to the end. I hope you had a good time, even if you love Sarin like he's your child. It was supposed to be a fun video and not infuriating, so sorry if that was the case. Sorin's still cool. I think the flawed reality is way more interesting than the archetype people think of him as. I should probably appear on camera right now, but I, I don't want to. So this silver mirror can be me instead. Look at him gradually zoom in and out. This took way longer than I thought it would to make. I want to make videos faster in the future, it's just a question of available time, which I don't have a ton of. And I do care a lot more about making something that I'm proud of rather than making something quick. But these new story spoilers are making me antsy, man. I really want to make a video about the Mir before we return to New Phyrexia. But I'm working on Guildless 3 now. I'm considering splitting that into two parts to get something out faster. I'm not sure if I have enough subscribers yet to effectively do a poll, but I'll try and see how people feel about Guildless 3 being two videos. Why not tell me how you feel about that now in the comments or even on Twitter. I have a Twitter account which I will use more often, I promise, if you follow me on it and you can look at it and say, oh, he's still alive. And subscribe to the channel if you haven't. I'm over halfway to a thousand subs now, which really feels like the first little milestone. The channel really is small enough that every time a video is shared, it makes a huge difference. So if you want to make a huge difference for me, then consider sharing the video somewhere. Thank ye. You'll get my undying appreciation. Unless I die. Thanks again. I'll see you in the next one. Hopefully quicker than last time. Unless I die.